Thank you. 
Well, a very warm welcome to everyone listening in today, uh, wherever you are, whether you're watching live or watching catch up, whether you're listening via our dial a service phone line, whether you're regular, it's your first time, it's great to have you here with us. My name is Tudor, and I've been praying that through this morning service, God would encourage you and help you to walk more closely with him, whether you're walking through sunny fields or through dark valleys, metaphorically. So thank you for tuning in as we worship Jesus together in our various houses. If you're a Facebook member, please do let us know that you're here. And uh, also, why not let us know your favourite pudding? Our notices will be on the screen again after the service, and they'll be read out for those who are our phone-in listeners too. Let's pause for a moment of quiet now, though, and I'll open our service with a prayer. A prayer of King Alfred, the King of England in the ninth century. Lord God Almighty, teach us that we may inwardly love you before all things. For you are our maker and our redeemer, our help and our comfort, our trust and our hope. Amen. Well, in our first song, we celebrate the greatness of Jesus. And we call one another to uh, lay down our lives before him as our saviour, lord and king. Please join with me with the words on the screen and on your, on your sheets as we sing At the Name of Jesus. Captain, 
time of uncertainty about what the next month or even couple of years will be like. It's easy to be inward looking and discouraged, isn't it? But God is never in the dark about what's happening. And he's given us certain promises of what eternity will be like with him, for all who trust in Jesus. Christians, then, are citizens of heaven. We're, we're able to live in freedom now and to face our fears, doing so with a confidence that we are loved by God. And so we come now to God at the foot of the cross. We come to confess our sins, to, to rend our hearts and claim the sure mercy that God gives through Jesus' death in our place. Let's uh, join together saying the words on the screen and on your sheets, the prayer of confession. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus, who died for us, forgive us for all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, may the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, God forgives his children, and he also gives every one of us mission and purpose. Our first Bible reading recalls God's call on one famous believer called Jonah. When he tried to run, or sail away from God, in the opposite direction, not obeying that call, God still had mercy on him. And we'll, do, we'll also hear what happened when Jonah did eventually obey God's call. David Tomlinson will read to us now from what God says in Jonah chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and then at Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 as well. The first reading is from Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, followed by Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to, to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good or bad, someone is, in human terms, God's call to us has always been the same. Turn back to me and trust me. That's what Jonah preached through warning what would happen otherwise. And that's what Jesus preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. But aren't things different now, when we know so much more, 2,000 years later? Well, let's sing again asking God to help us learn from what he teaches us in his timeless, ever-relevant word, as we sing, Help Us, O Lord, to Learn. Your laws may be in 
inscribed upon us. Help us, O Lord, to live that faith which we proclaim, that old and thought and words and deeds may glorify your Help us, O Lord, to teach the beauty of your ways, that all who seek may find the Christ and make a life of grace. Let's seek first God's kingdom now, praying the Lord's Prayer together in its modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Well, our second Bible reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, beginning at verse 29. And it'll be read for us by Eleanor Graham. The words will be on the screen too. Luke, chapter 11, beginning at verse 29. Our Bible reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, beginning at verse 29. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign but none will be given it except for the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Nevites, so also will be the Son of Man to be this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nivea will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, as we come now to look more closely at the use Jesus made of the story of Jonah, we ask you to fill this moment, Lord, Open our eyes to your presence, open your ears to your call, and open our hearts to your glory. Amen. Last week we saw how Jesus challenged the crowds and us to live lives of obedience that God can and does bless. This week he addresses another of the objections raised by those who heard him. Give us a sign. In other words, prove yourself by doing something we can accept as backing up your claims. Here we see Jesus addressing those who want what they want, a sign that they're comfortable with, or one that they can convince themselves is not really a sign. They have rejected the signs they were given. Jesus' response, on the face of it, seems a bit of a sideways step. He tells him, them to consider a man to whom God showed himself as the God of second chances, a God who challenges us to follow him into places we had rather not go, who is willing to renew that challenge even if and when we run away from it, and who is willing and able to bless our reluctant obedience. Who was this man Jonah? Many of us will be familiar with the story of Jonah the Old Testament prophet who lived about eight centuries before Christ, who, having been tasked with speaking God's message of the need to repent to the heathen city of Nineveh, chose not to do so and attempted to evade God's call. But after some significant adventures, he reluctantly did as God asked, saw a wonderful change of heart sweep over Nineveh, a city renowned in its time for its wickedness, 
but discovered he still had problems with the way God's justice appeared to work in the world. And why did Jesus call him a sign? A sign to the Ninevites that would be like the sign Jesus was going to be to the generation in which he was living and working. In what ways was Jonah a foretaste of who Jesus would be and what he would do? Can we see ways in which Jonah was a foretaste of Jesus? He certainly heard God sending him to tell the people of Nineveh that they were facing a terrible fate if they did not turn away from their wickedness. But unlike Jesus, who walked in obedience to the word he heard from his father, Jonah sought to run away, even as far as the ends of the known earth, in this case to the western coast of Spain. When he sees the results of that rebellion, the terrible storm which is threatening the lives of the sailors on the ship he has joined, he shoulders the responsibility and asks the sailors to throw him into the sea, a certain death as far as he knows. It's unlikely he could swim, he was a very long way from land, and there was a big storm blowing. God accepts his action and the ship is saved. So too is Jonah after three days and three nights inside a great fish. During this time he has plenty of opportunity to reflect on what his disobedience has brought about and eventually he turns back to the God whose purposes he rejected and God, the God of second chances, hears his heartfelt sorry and his intention to fulfil his calling. At this point God renews his call using words remarkably similar to those he used the first time and Jonah obeys. Jesus too had learned obedience, as Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 reminds us. The Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And Jesus picks up on the results of that obedience and draws a parallel with his own ministry to his own generation. Then he introduces another strand into the story. As the Jewish people had learned the story of Jonah, they had also learned the story of the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba, who had visited Solomon, that first great son of David, whose fame, wealth and wisdom had made him someone who drew people from far away. She, like the people Jonah was sent to, was a Gentile, but one whose heart was open to hear about the God who had revealed himself to the Jewish people. Jesus, who was the true son of David, born by human inheritance in the line of the first shepherd king, knowing that his hearers were familiar with the promises that one day God would raise up a greater king, a messiah, a saviour from the family of David, and yet being rejected by his own people, goes on to challenge them to believe that he was someone not just greater than Jonah but greater than Solomon. Solomon, who was indeed a son of David, and in his time a revered, wise and wealthy king of Israel. Jesus was here with a greater message, with the offer of greater wisdom and with greater authority. A couple of weeks ago we heard of the Heavenly Father who gives so much more. He gives better gifts than the best of earthly fathers, even the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And here we can see, if we will, that Jesus is in himself so much more than men had expected. If we compare Jesus and Jonah, we see that whilst Jonah ministered in Nineveh for a maximum of 40 days and worked no miracles, his efforts were rewarded by mass repentance and a turning back of God's plan to wipe the sinful city off the map. But Jesus ministered for three years performed many miracles and saw no mass repentance. The first recorded instances in the New Testament of masses turning to God in repentance come on the day of Pentecost, when the fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit affected many thousands. Yet the message Jesus came to bring was good news for eternity, not just the averting of a coming temporary disaster. Not only does Jesus have a greater message, he also has greater authority. In verse 30 of Luke chapter 11, 
Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man. Not just in the sense that he, like each of us, had a physical human body, but that he was claiming to be the fulfilment of much Old Testament teaching concerning the Messiah. Son of Man, Son of God. He comes not as Jonah did to tell of the destruction of their city, a serious but temporary affliction, but to warn mankind of the eternal consequences of turning their backs on God and preferring to go their own way. Before we reach the time when the secrets of all hearts will be revealed, he gives us the chance to let him reveal the secrets we keep in our own hearts, the excuses we make not to believe that he alone can save us eternally, the excuses we make to run away from opportunities he gives us to minister in his name. We have a tremendous calling, all of us, not just those we see as specially gifted, especially close to God or specially clever. Each of us who has chosen to follow Jesus and to seek to learn his way and his obedience has been charged with the task of preaching the good news to all nations, all types of people, no matter what they've been or what they've done. We may try to make Jesus' lack of instant max success an excuse for faithless disobedience. Or we may think, like Jonah, that we have turned down the chance to obey once and that there will be no second chances. But if we can gather together such courage as we have and come again to our God and Father, then we can discover, as Jonah did, as I have, that he is the God of second chances, who will trust us again with the precious gifts he wants to give. In the Narnia books, Mr. Beaver tells the children who have found themselves in Narnia that there is a lion called Aslan and that whilst he is not a safe lion, he is good. I think C.S. Lewis had it right. God is definitely not safe, but he is good. Good in ways that stretch our minds, our imaginations and our souls. So who have we seen today? What sort of God are we called to follow, to get to know, to allow into the deepest parts of our lives? A God of challenges that may seem too big for us. A God of second chances, always eager to welcome back any who are prepared to come in repentance. A God who blesses reluctant obedience beyond our wildest dreams. Anyone who has walked with Jesus through their days and nights will have stories to tell about this God. But we're often reluctant to share these things, fearful of making claims that might not stand up. Fearful, perhaps, of what might be asked of us next. But God is a Father God, and like the best human fathers, does not face us with challenges that are too big for us. He walks through them with us and gives over and above what we need to meet them. Take a moment now to reflect on anything that has touched you this morning, anything that we've said, sung or prayed or heard, anything that seemed important to you, and then I will pray for us all. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word which always has something new to teach us. Thank you that you love us so much that you want to see us grow in our love for you. Thank you that even now we can start afresh to walk in obedience. Come now, write your truths in our hearts and walk with us into the new week that is starting. Amen. Well, let's now join together with Christians around the world to affirm the core of our shared faith using the question and answer affirmation of faith that's on the screen. Do ye believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do ye believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. 
Do ye believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're going to sing now in response to God's word to us. We cannot see the future, uh, nor can we know uh, what's going on in other people's hearts. But we do have uh, an unfailing confidence in what God has promised, because he always does what he says. Join with me then as we delight in our hope in Jesus by singing, By faith and of God. And it will be followed, followed immediately by our prayers, which this week uh, are led for us by Leslie Davidson. Let's sing together then. God of all hope, we call on you today. We pray for those who are living in fear, fear of illness, fear for loved ones, fear of others' reactions to them. May your spirit give us a sense of calmness and peace. We pray for your church at this time of uncertainty, for those needing to make decisions in order to care for others. 
for those who will feel more isolated by not being able to attend worship. Grant us your wisdom. Holy God, we remember that you have promised that nothing will separate us from your love, demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to turn our eyes, hearts and minds to you. Amen. Father God, we lift to you all those in our neighbourhoods who are having to self-isolate or shield at this time. We pray for all those who are worried about getting shopping, regular hospital appointments or treatments, and are worried about day-to-day -day contact with other people. Surround them with your love and care so that they will know they are not alone at this time. Amen. We pray for the medical staff on the front line of care. We pray that they will be sustained physically, emotionally and spiritually in the coming weeks. We lift up to you any that we know in our congregations who work for the NHS and other key support workers in care homes. We pray that God will be their shield and their strength. And we pray that you will give us wisdom and insight as to how to support those in our congregations and communities who are involved in this frontline care. Amen. Father, we pray for our world leaders and for the leaders in our own country that they will seek the wisdom of God as they make decisions over the coming days. And we pray that you will give them the physical strength and the mental toughness to make these decisions. Amen. Father, we pray for all of those who are leading the scientific response to the COVID-19 pandemic across the world. We pray for scientists as they look for ways to alleviate the symptoms and as they seek a vaccine for the future. Amen. Father, we pray for a sense of calm and clarity, as well as strength to face what is ahead. We pray that you will make Christians a beacon of hope and carriers of the message of peace at this time. We pray that God will use his servants to accompany people spiritually and missionally through this valley of uncertainty, fear and potential death. May we be a people of hope in encouraging others in the face of crisis to lean on God's sustaining presence and unfailing providence. Loving God, if we are ill, strengthen us. If we are tired, fortify our spirits. If we are anxious, help us to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Do not let fear cause us to overlook the needs of others more vulnerable than ourselves. Fix our eyes on your story and our hearts on your grace. Help us always to hold fast to the good, seeing good in others, and remembering that there is just one hope, one world, one everlasting love, with baskets of bread for everyone. 
In Jesus we make our prayer. The one who suffered, died and was raised to new life. In whom we trust these days and all days. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, and if you'd like to add your own prayers or names of people to pray for to the comments on our Facebook page, please do so now. And we'll have a few moments uh, pause for you to do that, but also for us to pray for people that we know ourselves if we're not on Facebook uh, are listening and or whatever. A moment of quiet now to, to name in prayer, prayer quietly those we know in need of God's love and care. Well, we join now with other Christians across Cumbria this morning and pray the diocesan and coronavirus prayer. Loving God, as your son healed the sick and brought the good news to the needy, be with us this day. Loving Jesus, as you taught us to do unto others as you would have them do to you, be with all the caring professions this day. Loving Spirit, your gift is healing. Bring your healing fire to our homes, our hospitals and our county. But most of all, be with us this day. Amen. Well, thank you so much for celebrating Jesus with us today. And thanks again to David, uh, to Eleanor, to Sue, to Leslie, Cat, Mark and the Bryants for their recordings, which have helped us uh, along the way. I do remember that if you are watching live and you've got uh, internet, we'd love to join you for our virtual coffee at Zoom. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, it's good fun and also uh, quite uh, interesting discussions for those who are able to join us there. It'd be great if you can just email me your email address to vicartudor at gmail.com and I'll send you an email invite in a while. Well, after a closing uh, blessing, we'll finish with singing the modern version of Amazing Grace. It's got a, an added chorus, My Chains Are Gone. We sang it a few weeks ago, so it's not entirely new, hopefully. Uh, after that, we'll, we'll have some uh, on-screen questions for us to ponder, along with our notices rolling again. Then uh, we'll stop our recording and have our virtual Zoom coffee. Let me close with a prayer. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, accompany us in this day's journey. Dawn on our darkness, open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Well, let's sing Amazing Grace now.
Satellite.